Allah says within the Holy Quran that indeed He seeks to purify you a thorough purification and to remove from you all that which is impure. Insha'Allah, for the next three nights that we have with you, that we are blessed to remember Fatima al Zahra on this tragic occasion. We want to seek to understand the questions that arise. Why these particular questions repetitively come every single Fatimiyya, and in every single Fatimiyya we are left with more questions than we have answers. Understanding the fact that the issue of Fatima al Zahra raises much tension within the aspects of Shia belief and with dialogue within other schools of thought. As in whenever the issue of Fatima al Zahra والسلام, comes to light, you'll find people all of a sudden their ears pay extra close attention to the person that's speaking. Will that particular personality that's speaking mention particular names? Will he, for example, showcase the event in all its aspects, in all its atrocities, in all its oppression that occurred? And the idea that they want something to hold in order for them to attack the Shia faith. Now the issue we have, and as a disclaimer, whenever we mention the issues regarding Fatima al Zahra, there are many questions that come forward. Amongst the questions that come forward around the time where we commemorate the tragedy of Fatima al Zahra are questions, for example, people coming to try to create doubts in people's minds. Saying that, you know, with this particular incident of the door, how much can we really understand that a rib was broken? Was there really a miscarried child? I don't understand, for example, people will come forward and say, I don't understand how Fatima can come towards the door while Amir al is inside. And you'll find these are the type of questions that come forward to create doubts in people's minds regarding the event of the door. Now, if someone hears this, and they are from the followers of Ahlul Bayt, Many of them will not have answers to these particular questions. Rather, these questions, when they arise, will create more doubt in people's minds. If they do not have the answer, then they create solid foundations to stand on. Now, therefore, when Fatimiyya comes, there needs to be a push in order for us to look at each individual question that comes forward in order for us to explore the different manners in which we can reply to these questions to first and foremost, for ourselves, create a solid foundation. And on the second level, once we understand this solid foundation, we'll have no problem when these questions come in the future because we understand why these particular events occurred. When someone will come forward and ask, why did Fatima answer the door and not Ali ibn Abi Talib? We need to have a proper answer to suffice ourselves on the first level. Then we'll begin to understand how to answer it towards other people within the Islamic fold. Now, inshallah, during these three nights, what we aim to do is to answer one of the many questions surrounding the event of the door of Fatima al Zahra. And the one that we're going to seek to analyze and understand and answer. By the end of these three nights is the question that people come forward and ask. If you say that Fatima al Zahra's event is correct, can you please explain? For a household that has a man inside, why was the lady of the house the one that answered the door? Some people pose the question differently and they would come forward and say, why did Fatima go to open the door? And you'll see these different ways that they pose the question creates even more doubt in people's minds. So inshallah, over the course of these three nights, we want to tackle this particular issue. And by the end of these three nights, we will have a solid understanding and an answer to suffice ourselves. And indeed to utilize, to answer anyone that asks us as followers of Ahlul Bayt. Now, understanding this perspective of where we're heading towards. 
let's look at Islam in a more holistic approach. Because many of us, when we look at Islam, when you ask other than the school of Ahlul Bayt, the picture that's painted is always what? Is that Islam was this, after Rasulullah was this issue where every single person got along in this peaceful, beautiful manner. Where the reality of the issue is the absolute opposite. Where you'll find after Rasulullah returns towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll find that's where all the aspects of difference of opinion begins. The conflict begins. The battles, the issues between one another, all of a sudden begin to stem. And that's why when people come forward and say, well, hold on. Whenever you talk about companions, we want to put a full stop there and then. Why? Because they have this particular rule in place. What's this rule? That they say you should remove your hand from any particular hadith that has conflict between the Sahaba. Al-Kaf an ma shajara bayn al Sahaba. They have this particular issue that if you find any conflict within the books, any hadith that they had two people known as companions, that they had a fight between one another, do not mention it, do not relate it, do not even bring it up. Why? Lest your heart becomes hardened towards someone that was considered to be a companion. But the reality of the matter is what? When we look into the history books, we'll find many companions fought one another. If we say that this particular quarrel or this particular conflict was resolved, different issue. But what if this particular conflict led to the death of another companion? Isn't Islamic faith a faith that preaches the understanding that the killer and the killed will both be in heaven? As in what religion would preach that, you know, it doesn't matter whether you, a person kills you or you are killed, you're both going to see each other in heaven. What religion says this? How can you accept a religion that says a killer and the killed are both in heaven? So taking this perspective, can you imagine? Let's take an example. That, for example, let's say Shimur, the killer of Aba Abdullah and Imam al Hussein. Can someone accept that they're both in heaven? Question. So all of a sudden when we go to the history books of Islam, we'll begin to find that they had wars against one another. You look at Jamal, Safin, Nahrawan. These battles weren't between Muslims and non-Muslims. These battles were between Muslims and Muslims. And the death toll was significantly high amongst these three battles in the time of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, taking this into perspective, all of a sudden we understand each and every individual companion needs to be looked at and see, did he follow the path of Rasulullah or did he, as the Quran say, return back towards his old habits? And that's where Fatima al-Zahra comes into perspective. Because the way that the people, Muslims, try to paint the picture of Fatima al-Zahra is of the utmost importance when it comes to the issue of the door of Fatima al-Zahra. And we're going to look at tonight is the different lenses that people try to paint the picture of Fatima before speaking about the issue of the door. And it's of the utmost importance. Why? Because if I say as an example, two people had a problem between one another. One was angry with the other person. If they're normal people, it doesn't really make a difference, does it? I mean, one person is always angry with another. But if all of a sudden I say, the person that was angry, Rasulullah, said a statement that said, whomever Fatima is angry with, I'm angry with. And whomever I'm angry with, Allah is also. So all of a sudden, the anger of the individual has a particular perspective, doesn't it? So when you go into the history books, the first understanding is they try to diminish from the personality, the persona, and the character of Sayyidah Fatima. How? You'll find, when you go to the books, some people try to paint the picture of Fatima al-Zahra being a normal person. As you know, say, say, this was a great lady, you know, she was the daughter of Rasulullah. That's where it stops. You know, she was a lady like any other ladies. That's how they tried to paint the picture. Some come forward and say, no, you know, she was a great lady. Why? 
She was lucky enough, they say, to marry Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. That she was very lucky in the fact that she was the daughter of the final messenger. That she had a great status in the idea that her children were Sayyidi Shabab Ahl al-Jannah. And they cocoon her to that fact that she was only great because of the personalities that revolved around her. So they paint that picture. Does she have an importance, you ask? They'll reply by saying, no, but she was great because of the people around her. You know, sometimes you hear a last name, you know, especially us. When we hear a particular last name from a you know, renowned family, all of a sudden you're like, oh, mashallah, I better treat them with respect. That he's from this particular family. They're very well known. They're very revered within the community. The fact that they only have the last name, that they're related to a personality, you treat them with respect. You treat them with love, ihtiram, a particular aura, how you act around them. But how did they act around Fatima Tazara? And she was the daughter of the greatest creation of mankind. And that's a question we need to ask. You know, before we, all of this, Rasulullah says, I want nothing from you except that you love my new ones. But you find, even with that particular perspective, Rasulullah says, I don't want anything except this. Ali struck in sujood. Hassan poisoned, Hussein massacred, Fatima killed behind the door and the wall. So you take these particular perspectives, and then you begin to analyze and understand why they tried to paint Fatima in such a picture. Because if we were to take Fatima to Zahra in the reality that she is, they will have a problem. The biggest issue, the biggest issue that the way that we need to understand this, the biggest issue of why they try not to bring the issue of Fatima to light is the following. Because you'll find the issue of Imam al Hussein always mentioned. It's allowed to be spoken of, it's allowed to be published, it's allowed to be spoken of in a context where you can have millions of people, no problem. But when it comes to the issue of Fatima throughout history, you don't find anyone that allows the issue to be spoken of. Why? It's very important to understand. Every single person that sat on the throne of Khilafah, that was taken from Amir al-Mu'mineen, ensured that no one spoke about the issue of Fatima al-Zahra. You'll find any of the martyrdoms and the massacres and the oppression regarding any of the Imams. Let's take any of them. For example, Amir al-Mu'mineen. You'll find the killers can be cocooned. You know, Ibn Muljim, the person that, for example, instigated it, the person that promised particular pleasures, what have you, that will be rewarded to him, cocooned into who killed him or the responsible party of who killed him. Likewise, Imam al-Hussein. We remember Abu Abdullah. But it can be cocooned. You can be cocooning them, for example, to an ideology. You can cocoon them towards the 30,000 that fought Amir, uh, Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. You can cocoon them towards the um, Umayyads in the sense that Yazid was the person responsible. But they can be cocooned. Fatima al-Zahra's issue is very different. How so? Because Fatima's death was in defense of the rightful place that was taken from Amir al muminin Now very, very close attention to this point. Fatima died defending the aspect that the Khilafah that was granted by Allah towards Amir al muminin has been taken. When she fought the first Khalifa by the name of Abu Bakr, what did she say? When she fought him, the whole understanding was the fact that she spoke out, when we look at khutbah, when we say Fadakiyah, it's khutbah al fatimiyya the great khutbah of Fatima. Few lines was about Fadak. The whole lecture was to speak about what? The injustice that's occurring. Look at where you were, look at what my father has brought towards you, where he's taken you from, where has he guided you towards. And this is the position that you've taken for my Imam, which is Amir al-Mu'mineen. 
So the understanding here is all of a sudden what? If Fatima al-Zahra goes against the Khalifa of the time, if she disproves the Khilafa of Abu Bakr, what happens? Every single person that goes on the throne after him is disproved. Why? Because on the first level, so you go towards the Sunni theology and understanding of how you can choose a Khalifa. Yeah? They say that one of the ways that you can choose a Khalifa if people come together and two people give bay'ah towards someone, then he can become Khalifa. They say another way is that a person can write a will and in his will he can say this person succeeds me. Where did they get the sunnah from? Because if it was from Rasulullah, Rasulullah was going to write the Amir al muminin is after me. But what did the Khalifa known as Umar ibn, Umar ibn al-Khattab say? What did he say? The calamity of Thursday, what happens? Rasulullah says, bring me a pen and paper to write for you. That which will never go astray after me. What does he say? You go look it up on the internet. The calamity of Thursday. Omar says towards Rasulullah, This person is delirious. But subhanallah, if Abu Bakr writes a will, and in his will he says towards the Ummah that Omar is after me, it's fine. But Rasulullah is trying to write something and it's not allowed. But that's taken. So the understanding now is, if Abu Bakr wasn't allowed to rule, he wasn't allowed to write a wasiyah that Omar is after me. If Omar wasn't after him, he would not be allowed to put six people in a room to choose a Khalifa after him, and so on. Every single person after would fall one by one if the issue of Fatima stood in their eyes. Now there's a problem. Fatima has too many traditions surrounding her. Fatima, Rasulullah says on multiple occasions, that whomever angers her, angers me. Whomever angers me, angers Allah. Big problem. Why? Because all of a sudden, she is in a sense unified with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when she comes towards the first Khalifa, she says to Abu Bakr, Oh Abu Bakr, this is my right. Or she will say that this fedak belongs to me. Or give me my inheritance. You have two opposite ends of the spectrum. Either Fatima al-Zahra is truthful. And in her truth, it means the other person is lying. Or the opposite aspect. Either he is with the truth, which makes Fatima what? Wal-iyadu billah the liar in this aspect and you can understand where it falls into perspective when we mentioned chapter 33 verse 33 in the Holy Quran Allah testifies when Amir al muminin comes towards the courtroom he asks this particular question he says to Abu Bakr he says oh, Abu Bakr Fatima all of a sudden she's asking from you her right she's asking from you her inheritance and you've denied her on all fronts I want to ask a question. What's the question? He says, if people come forward and say that Fatima has performed an indecent act, what would you say? You say, I would ask for witnesses. He says, what if the witnesses came forward? He says, look at the way that they thought and how they tried to paint the picture of Fatima. He says, well, if witnesses come forward and say that she's performed an indecent act, then I will prosecute her. I mean, look what he says. He says, then you haven't understood this religion. Why? He says, how can you believe creation in what they claim when the creator himself testified to her purity? Where? He says, within the Holy Quran. Where does he say this? Allah. <laughs> So the understanding now is what? That she is truthful. 
Because she cannot sin in any manner because this testifies to her infallibility. Now, if we've understood through the Holy Quran itself that Fatima al-Zahra cannot lie, therefore her claim becomes truthful. If her becomes truthful, the claim, it means the other person is what? Going against that which is truthful, making them the liars in this perspective. And that's why, on an ending note, we understand that Fatima in her will, what did she write to Amir al-Mu'mineen? Make sure that anyone that comes after will question this particular issue that I died for. How will they question? By asking one simple aspect, where is Fatima buried? If you ask that, you'll have the reply, we don't know. Why don't we know? Because she died angered. Whom was she angered with? You can go to Bukhari to understand that one as well. So inshallah, tomorrow night, we're going to delve deeper into the understanding of the position of Fatima al-Zahra in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once we've understood that on the second night, the third night, we want to answer the question, why did Fatima go towards the door? And inshallah, we'll have a solid understanding by the end of the three nights of why Fatima went towards the door and Ali did not. So inshallah, we end on that note and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows us the success in order for us to continue on the path of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad that he allows us to be of the companions of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman with the Surah al-Mubarakat al-Fatiha but before it allowed salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.